Perfect. So let's get started. Uh, before we jump into the, the meat and potatoes of this whole talk, uh, we wanted to walk through just a little bit of a story, um, a story about configuration and something that you you might have experienced. I would assume that you have, um, but you might already, you might have been uh, born in the new age and not have to experience this. So we're going to talk through it anyways. So meet Bob. Bob's an SRE at Acme Corp. And he's one of those SREs that manages a handful of servers. Too many servers that uh, it, it's somewhat difficult to manage, but he could still do it by hand. And Bob's on call because he's he's one of a few people on his team. And so he's on call one night and he gets paged. And this is something I assume we've all experienced. And so he starts to check out what's going on. And he notices that a server restarted. And when it restarted, it started operating incorrectly. And so he's not sure what's going on, but he can he can see that there's alerts happening. Uh, and so he starts to look into it. So first line of action, as of, uh, of course, he goes and SSHs into the server and notices it's on fire and uh, starts debugging a little, little bit and notices that it's the Nginx configuration file. So somehow that this, this configuration file was set up wrong. Uh, so he opens up a Vim session. Now, Unfortunately for all the Emacs uh, users in the group, uh, Vim er, Bob is a hardcore Vim user, and he's gonna he's gonna get on get in there, start changing everything that he needs to change. And once he figures everything out, he saves, he quits the file, and then he goes and reloads Nginx. And as you'd hopefully expect when somebody was to reload Nginx, the server comes back fine and everything's good to go. So. Yeah, now we're here 24 hours later, and at Acme, I'd like to introduce you to somebody named Carol. Carol is a dev, and she's been working on an awesome feature. And this feature needs to be deployed. It requires a feature flag to be configured in a newer version of the config. And so she's got everything code reviewed. She's super excited about it. It's going to add value for the experimental user base. Uh, that's just a subsection of all of the people that Acme serves. And she hits the deploy button with the approval to start the imperative bash script that Jenkins uses to orchestrate the rolling update of the Nginx config. And things are going good. She's watching the metrics. Things are rolling out all green. And suddenly, the patch logic inside of that bash script, it's just not having it with the newer version of the config uh, that was changed by Bob in his incident response. And suddenly, Carol's seeing 502s and 400s uh, in downstream services because the feature flag is not enabled globally for a long enough period of time for the feature to do its rollout. And um, now the servers are in this inconsistent state. We have configuration drift, uh, which is this problem that was supposed to be solved with systems like Puppet and Chef. Now, we have mechanisms to deal with this kind of issue. And in Kubernetes land, uh, we just take different approaches. We have different mechanisms. Chris, could you teach us a little bit about why Kubernetes API machinery starts to solve this problem and what the basic mechanisms are? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you're probably all familiar with what we're looking at here. The deployment YAML, it's just Kubernetes. Um, and realistically, because at this day and age, we should all just call ourselves YAML engineers, this should be very familiar. But if it's not, we're gonna dive into the, the nuts and bolts of how this thing works. So, one of the biggest important things about this is that every Kubernetes YAML uh, file is actually versioned and it has a version schema that defines it. And you can see this up at the top of this file, uh, denoted by the GVK or the group version kind. And uh, what's really interesting and nice about these things is they can be kind of annoying because of how terse they are and how much you have to write and the fact that we all have to deal with this day in and day out. But they define exactly what the state of the world is supposed to be. And this is where the, the, the declarative nature of Kubernetes and Kubernetes style APIs uh, gets really nice. And when you go back into it and you really look at that, that GVK, you start to realize that this actually provides us some really good benefits. So if we, if we um, debug this a little bit, we can see that the group in this instance for deployments is actually apps and the version is that V1, uh, that V1 tag. And then underneath each one of those versions that can be defined, and there can be 
any number of these that, that are needed to, to get to a stable state, uh, we have kinds represented. And so under apps, we have things like uh, daemon sets as well and deployments. Uh, when you start to talk about more the the lower level core objects, you have things like pods that are just under the V1 API. Technically, the group is called core, but you don't have to write it. Um, and so it gives us this ability to do things like provide version uh, stability guarantees. So if I have a cluster and I know in my cluster I have version one and V1 beta one, if I supply V1 beta one, I know it's going to work because that, that API is already exposed. And I can expect that my schema for that that I'm using that is a valid schema will satisfy what Kubernetes expects to be passed into it. And what's really cool here is we have these structured schemas and we're able to take these and really start to think about them from a machine level and a human level. I, as a person, can go and write this manifest file. It does, might take me a little bit. I might have to go and look at Stack Overflow to grab the uh, the actual schema because I don't remember them always off the top of my, my head. But at the same time, I can build tools to actually work with these things. So you see this in the common tooling that we have today that everybody works with, whether you're just creating a cluster uh, and you're just using kubectl, or if you're starting to be a little bit more advanced and work with templating and packaging of your applications using things like customize, or even further beyond that into the whole plethora of, of other uh, third-party tools that work with this, things like Helm and Pulumi and uh, CDK. There's so many tools out there these days that can use this version schema to provide Kubernetes uh, a standard API. Yeah, this is um, a really great benefit when we get to actually work with these APIs, right? So say you have Kubernetes, you're, us you're using these Kubernetes native tools. Now you can provide configuration and these APIs, they promise you stability. They promise you versioning. You get the benefits of validation, defaulting, and conversions between these APIs using common tooling. But if you're just running your own workloads or Unfortunately, I mean, we have to run a lot of other people's workloads. They're just these Unix style programs, right? You invoke them and then you give them arbitrary strings. It just so happens that we've used flags for so long that every major programming language now has parsers for flags, but it doesn't have to be that way. Like the fact that we have hyphen hyphen versus slash slash or backslash, like, you know, is common in Windows uh, command line tools. It's arbitrary. There's actually parsers that need to be built into your component, into your programs that work with these flags. But those flags are config, right? That's how you indirect, that's how you change the way that your programs behave. And say you're running a lot of programs, right? Because uh, we've got these custom parsers and, and we are able to work with convenient small deployments. But say you're running Kubernetes, right? This is an example of a smaller Kubernetes cluster there's you know, uh, five etcds here. There's a couple of kubelets running for various nodes, as well as kube proxy. You've got the API server in a uh, redundant deployment. Uh, and then you have all of the controller managers and your own webhooks and operators to support your configuration of the cluster. Uh, this is a lot of different components. Even if you're not running Kubernetes, uh, say you're in an environment like Bob and Carol, where you were managing your own servers, the reality is that in order to run modern businesses these days, uh, we happen to have gotten ourselves into a world of managing multi-program distributed cloud deployments. And when you're doing things with flags, uh, it can be hard to make promises across changes to your program. Let's consider the kubelet. This is one component, one instance of it uh, on a single node inside of that Kubernetes cluster we were just talking about. There's a wall of configuration here in the form of flags because the kubelet literally has like 150 options or something like that. And each one of those flags, uh, some of them are common deliberate. Some of them you can pass multiple versions of the flags and it builds into a collection. Uh, some are accepting integers, but the raw type of flags is a string. And so there's parsers that have to be built into the kubelet and the kubelet is the authority on those things. So then if you want custom tooling, right, to be built around this harder configuration problem, it becomes quite clumsy to work with what really is a public API that's represented by these flags, right? Tools don't understand these structures. You've got to, what, import the parsers from the kubelet into your config management tool. And the fact of the matter is that this is just something that's very brittle. 
Uh, and it's not very fun to deal with either. This is not easy to look at if you're an operator trying to understand the difference between some node pools of your Kubelet deployments. And this is true as well for any of the workloads that you might be building yourself. And so the Kubernetes solution that we've been playing with in more recent versions of the uh, releases is to support what's called component config. Here we have an example of a kubelet configuration, just the very beginning of that API that would be equivalent to the flag set that we were looking at before. And this allows us to use Kubernetes style APIs, groups, versions, and kinds. Uh, in We've talked about how humans like to read and author these because YAML is a better format than a bunch of strings on one line. And tools like them because it's a good serialization format and it gives us types and versioning so that we can do formal patching and munging of config, as well as the fact that it's a version schema, which just helps everybody, right? And so that, that enables tools to build ecosystems that rely on that version being supported inside of the kubelet for a specific period of time. And then it also lets people uh, pick their own strategy for upgrading. And so we've got Kubelet, uh, we've got component config, right? The fact that you can load a, a Kubernetes API owned by the component that needs to be configured directly from a file. But then we want to get out of this world of where components are out of sync with their configs. And so you need some sort of controller. There, all, there isn't always a controller that's taking care of you. And so in the Kubelet, we've been running an experiment called dynamic Kubelet configuration. What dynamic kubelet config will do is you tell the kubelet, hey, in the API server that you can connect to, there's a config map that's holding your config. It's holding all of the data in a raw format that you can then load in and validate and default and convert yourself. And uh, this means that we are using the kubelet's controller to also reload its own config and change the way that it behaves. Uh, so this is a pattern that's uh, quite useful. But um, we need some way to do that conversion, right? This is this kind of creates a problem. So if the API server isn't what owns the kubelet config API, then we don't get the benefits of all the machinery that's built inside of the API server. There's conversions, defaulting, and um, validation that's normally provided as those APIs are defined and registered inside of what would normally be hosted in Kubernetes. But now we don't get that luxury. So since the kubelet is written in Go, what we can do is we can import the same libraries that are necessary to do that API machinery inside of the API server. And we can use some of those same functions inside of our kubelet's config implementation. This allows us to support the alpha and beta versions of the kubelet configuration concurrently with a single version of the kubelet. We do this through an internal hub type. So at the top of this diagram, you see this is apps internal deployment. But imagine having a kubelet configuration be the internal type. And then you have these bidirectional function pairs, each one of these lines or these spokes in the diagram, connecting to the hub allows us to then get from v1 alpha 1 to the internal type or v1 alpha 1 through the hub type to the v1 beta 1 version. So you can build tooling around these APIs by importing the Go native library. And, uh, now, it's fantastic that we have these internal uh, types that we can use Go native libraries and API machinery to extend our tools, our actual programs that need to run. But in a world of controllers and operators, we actually have the luxury of the API server. Chris, would you tell us a little bit about CRDs? Yeah. So as Lee's calling them CRDs, uh, they're also represented as custom resource definitions. And you've probably heard this term. Uh, it's gotten a lot of buzz in the last uh, year or so. Uh, it originally spawned from a feature called TPRs, or third-party resources. Uh, and it's been around for a, a bit in Kubernetes. But when you start to actually dive into it, it's not that complex if you understand what a Kubernetes style API is. And so in, in this example, you can see that we have uh, an API version and a kind, and that API version being API extensions, kits.io slash v1. So it's a stable API, and it has a kind of custom resource definition. And as we kind of like dive into these things, you start to realize what it really is doing. So it is allowing us to 
take a Kubernetes API server, just the raw API server, no extra servers, no extra pods that are actually having to serve direct requests. And it allows us to dynamically create APIs against that, uh, that control plane. So in this example, uh, we're defining out in the under the spec field, we define a group of github.go.hind.dev. And then under it, we actually define uh, some kinds. So we have the kind of repository. We define the list kind so that Kubernetes knows how to parse these, these attributes. Uh, and then we define the singular and plural version so that it understands the, the, the way that these things are structured and how, how people might address them. And then the last thing in here, you're defining a version. And so this is taking a YAML manifest and saying, I want to tell Kubernetes that I'm going to give it this new object. And it, again, doesn't need an extra server, doesn't need anything special. It's just a YAML manifest. And then Kubernetes starts to do some special magic with it. So Chris, you're saying that if I just give Kubernetes a CRD, then I can specify a type of object and it will create an API for me and give me all of the benefits of the Kubernetes API server for free? Absolutely, which is what's so cool about these things. And I think that they're probably one of my favorite features realistically in Kubernetes. I spend way too much time doing these. As you can see, this example is about creating GitHub repositories. Like who thinks of, who who, who wants to go and manage GitHub using Kubernetes? It's it's a weird experience and, a, and, and more like an experiment for me to do. But as you can see here, we're taking uh, kubectl and saying get with an, uh, an output of YAML, and we're calling against repositories, this resource that is not in every Kubernetes cluster. It's non-standard. It kind of doesn't make any sense, but it's fun to play with. And now I can say, uh, I'm going to create a repository sample. And under it, when you really look at this object, you can see everything that's going on behind the scenes. I have my GVK defined that we defined using that Kubernetes manifest before, the actual CRD manifest. And so it's github.go.hind.dev v1 alpha one, again, from that last slide when we showed, showed the version getting exposed. And the kind is now repository. So I can define these things, create as many of these as I want, kubectl apply them, and Kubernetes is gonna go and dynamically create these endpoints, exactly what, what Lee was asking about, creating these endpoints um, that you see under the self-link under metadata. So it's hmm. going to be slash APIs, the group, the version, the actual kind of resource, and then the the actual name of the resource that it's fetching. And so it dynamically creates these things and allows Kubernetes to store those resources for you. So what about the other benefits then? I mean, it's like we can declare the schema of our data. Like, do I get validation? And like, what's the value of versions if I can't convert between things? Yeah. <laughs> The Kubernetes community has thought of it all. I mean, we've got we've got ways to do all of these things. So uh, at the actual YAML level, you can define the schema per version. And so as you can see here, we're using OpenAPI v3 schema. And say, for instance, under this, we have a spec attribute. And under that, there's a it expects there to be a home page. And I I don't want to get requests that are that are rejected from from GitHub. So I have a pattern match on that uh, attribute. I'm always going to make sure that it matches a, a true URL. So it's going to have to have www, or it's going to have to have HTTP or HTTPS, and then whatever else follows after that, so that I know that I can pre-validate, in essence, before I send off to another uh, endpoint. And even beyond that, I can do things like matching based on the type. So I can expect an integer. I can expect a string. And I can create these complex structures. And as Lee was asking about the, the versioning and all of that stuff, these are per version, as you can see across the top and also on the next slide, where we define out those versions. So now I can go through and say, I'm going to define a v1 alpha one. I'm going to serve it, and we'll go into what these fields mean in a second. And I'm going to store that v1 alpha one. And then I'm going to define a v1 beta one. I'm going to serve it. And then I'm also going to define a v1 and serve that one true as well. So now I have this uh, this structure where uh, in the in the comments there is actually where you define that schema that we just talked about. And so now I have uh, three different versions, all exposed at the Kubernetes control plane. I didn't create a web server. I didn't create anything. I didn't set any up, any proxying or anything like that. It's just purely exposed. And anytime I make a request to v1, it's going to uh, it's going to try and actually serve that request and, and uh, fulfill that request. Now, 
This is where we get into the weird space. Now, when, when Lee was talking about API machinery conversions and how that works in, uh, in component config, we have something similar in this space, but we do it a little bit differently because now we're on the, on the back end, so we can't uh, just do it client side. So we actually define a conversion strategy for these. And so you, in this example, we're using the webhook conversion strategy. You can actually, uh, you define the versions that you want to convert between. So when this API server gets a V1 or a V1 beta one, uh, it's gonna know to take that object and lob it over to this web server that we're exposing. You can configure the t mutual TLS between the API server and that, and that webhook server. You define the path you want it to request upon, and it sends you a, a just a standard object that you can parse, validate, convert into whatever you need, and then pass it back to the API server. Now, how this all works behind the scenes is, is continuing to be slightly different, but still the same notion at the end of the day. If you notice back in the, in the uh, versions slide, I talked about served and stored. In that example, I was using, uh, I was serving all the APIs so that anybody could supply a V1 alpha one, V1 beta one, or V1. And I need to actually go and convert those to store into that V1 alpha one, which is what I defined, uh, which is what I told Kubernetes to make the schema and etcd about. So to do that, behind the scenes, the webhook is, is in essence taking in uh, and converting and treating that V1 alpha one as the hub type that we defined uh, earlier. So when you do this, you define, and this is following the patterns that we've developed within QBuilder these days. Um, and so this is a, a form of a form of those API machinery, but instead you define a convert to and a convert from instead of having a handful of auto-generated functions uh, from API machinery. So this is saying, I wanna convert uh, my V1 beta one to my V1 alpha one. And if I wanted to convert back because I expected to get a V1 beta one object back, I can convert that back through before passing that back to the user. And same goes for the V1 alpha one. And what's kind of interesting here is like, as you're starting to realize, we can tell Kubernetes that we want to store any type of object. I created a repository here. It's nothing to do with K Kubernetes, but it doesn't really do me any good when you really start to just realize that this is just being treated as a data store. So Lee, can you talk a little bit about controllers and how those work? Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, controllers are the exciting idea of Kubernetes in my opinion. Right. Um, and the value of a controller succinctly is that it allows us to take that declared data and then build a level triggered system around what it declares so that we can get reliable convergence behavior. I say level triggered, which is different than if you've ever heard of an edge triggered system, uh, which uses events or changes in values. Uh, translated as events to cause controllers to operate on those changes. Where in a level triggered system, it's different. You see this a lot in pull based workflows like Puppet and Chef, uh, where they're constantly looking at the current state of what is declared and desired and what is actually there. Now, in a level triggered system, since you're always aware of where you want to be and where you are, you can reliably compute what needs to be done to get you to the desired state. And what makes Kubernetes controllers more fun than what we've had in previous systems is that the Kubernetes API server exposes this thing called a watch. The watch is enabled by the consistent data store of etcd, and it's got some machinery in there that gives us a stream of events with some guarantees. And so without etcd, uh, you don't kind of have the basic mechanisms to be able to build edge triggered reconciliation in a level triggered system, right? And so uh, because of the machinery and the mechanisms available in the API server, combined with what etcd gives us as a data store, uh, we can get much more rapid reconciliation from our reliable controllers. And so when you combine that technical solution of a controller with the fact that we can extend the Kubernetes API with custom resources, this allows us to build our own controllers that allow us to model declarative control of what would normally be really error prone and require people to be involved. And uh, I think that that's super exciting. So controllers, they're the big idea, but you might have heard the hot term of operators, right? <laughs> Chris, can you help me understand what's the distinction here? Yeah, well, besides being an awesome buzzword uh, th these days, it's there's there's some meat behind this. So what a what an actual operator is meant to be is it something that 
takes that that control loop theory and, and the, the way that we're building Kubernetes, and it tries to take non-standard um, tooling to bring them into that world. So you can you've probably experienced things like um, there's a there's an etcd operator out there, for example, and so that that is taking a complex tool chain and trying to make it so that it, it is an automated system that can be leveraged by Kubernetes. Can you take and say, I want an etcd instance and it's going to deploy those resources into your cluster, maybe outside of your cluster, wherever it needs to, to function and convert them into this, this system of reconciling to a desired state. And so, as you can kind of imagine, these are all, or a lot of these systems are built off of uh, older style APIs. And this is just bringing it into the new world, taking, getting rid of those, or trying to, to hide, I guess, more or less, the imperative systems that are under the hood. But this is the unfortunate thing about this, is their applications in themselves, which means there's more for you to manage, which means Bob's got more work to do or somebody's got more work to do to actually make these things work and to keep them up and keep them stable and keep them configured. And so that's kind of where, where this whole thing starts to connect back together. Um, these operators are gonna cause a lot of overhead. You need that config to be managed. And you also need to make sure that you're not leaking the abstractions uh, of, of what's really uh, going on under the hood and making sure that you define a, a solid API that, that follows those declarative patterns. And this is where we bring back in the notion of, okay, these probably are going to be, be created out of the box with things like flags. And so we're back to this, yeah. this world. That seems a little problematic, right? Uh, we talked about how flags, you know, as you're trying to maintain the configuration of a component can become a little bit difficult to maintain guarantees for, you know, especially if you're writing an operator and you're trying to distribute that to other teams that are deploying and getting value out of the new APIs that you are controlling. Uh, you want to be able to give somebody a guarantee that the way that the operator is configured to work uh, is going to function next year. Right? And so maybe instead of using flags, we could adopt the Kubernetes native solution. Right? What we're doing in the actual components inside of Kubernetes, can we use component config inside of operators? Right? So in this diagram, we have a deployment. A deployment is facilitated in Kubernetes because of other control loops that are running in the cluster. We have the controller manager, which is actually operating the deployment struct and then creating pods. We have the kube scheduler, which is assigning those pods to nodes. We have the kubelet watching for pods to what end up on its node and then actually schedule it with the config maps and secrets and volume mounts and all of that properly configured so that the pod runs in the way that we specify. Right, and so we have these control loops taking care of us. If we put a component uh, config in the data field of a config map and then project that volume out into the operator container inside of our deployment, then we will end up with pods that have that data on the file system. That gives the operator freedom to then import API machinery and own the API of the component config. A dynamic version of this example involves a little bit of different machinery. Here, what we would do is we would modify the operator's control loop to actually keep a watch with the API server for its component config from a data field. This could also be uh, driven by a secret instead of a config map. And so instead of relying on the controllers that are inside of the cluster, say we want to deploy the operator externally from the cluster, uh, but still get this dynamic confo component config reload, uh, this would be the analogy to the dynamic kubelet config experiment that we've been running, uh, but directly built into the operator's control loop to change the way that it behaves. And so this is how we can use component config and the existing examples and um, kind of like history that's already been established there for the technical implementation of using Kubernetes APIs to give promises for configuration for our controllers themselves bootstrapping them, actually running them and getting them to connect to an API server, do leader collection between themselves, uh, configure auth and mutual TLS. Um, but there is an even more interesting world beyond component config, beyond just bootstrapping the controllers and getting them to update in a consistent way. And that has to do with then using custom resources in the control loop to change behavior. Chris, can you tell us about it? <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. The, again, CRDs are like are, are my bread and butter these days. I I love the the thoughts that you can do with these things. And so taking taking uh, custom resources and and trying to fit this into a model of managing configuration and dynamic configuration is pretty fantastic because you have informers that are built in. As long as you're using the client Go libraries and all of that, you have informers that you can set watches on, and you can say anytime this config CR. Uh, changes or anytime a new config CR gets added, I can load that in and I can dynamically reconfigure my my controller or my operator. And so you see this actually being done in a, a lot of a lot of places already. Um, and this is trying to really bring up this as a pattern and make sure that people know that we can get some really good benefits out of it. So for example, um, this is actually currently being implemented uh, directly into controller runtime and it'll be coming out, I believe, in the next release uh, in the next couple months. And that allows us to automatically have those version schemas directly with any controller runtime based project. And so uh, when this gets released, that'll end up in operator SDK, it'll end up in Cube Builder, and you'll be able to create operators that are already using these or create controllers that are already using these configuration files. But then we can, mm -hmm. we can munge new worlds into it to do uh, that, that runtime level configuration. So uh, we can do things like configuring um, the the way that storage classes work in Kubernetes, for example. How would you select a different storage class? And we can build those methodologies into this pattern. Lee, do you want to talk about Cert mm -hmm. Manager and, and uh, Contour? Yeah, Cert Manager and Contour have some great prior art on this. Uh, they're some of the earliest and most successful controllers and operators uh, in the ecosystem. And Cert Manager has this idea of an Acme issuer. Uh, and so if you have these namespaced issuers or cluster issuers, then you are able to then pair those up with the certificate objects that ultimately need to be certified by the issuer that's running. And this is an example of Cert Manager providing uh, multiple uh, instance of configuration API that then changes the way that the control loop treats other resources in the same cluster. And then we get to Contour, which is my favorite. Um, they invented this idea of namespace delegation. I'd really like to chat with who came up with this, uh, but I saw a great talk by Josh Russo a couple years ago uh, talking about this idea. We also use this idea of namespace delegation inside of Flux's Helm operator. And so this is a, it's a very powerful pattern that allows you to use a custom resource of one type in a parent or administrative namespace. And with the way that you declare that custom resource in that administrative namespace, you can change the way that the controller reacts to and behaves on custom resources of another type in the target namespace. And so the way that they use this in Contour is with their old ingress route API, you could do ingress route delegation, which would allow you to administer the way that subdomains were treated in other namespaces to restrict tenants. And then in Flux with Helm operator, we have a Helm release delegation, which allows you to declare Helm releases in one namespace that ultimately end up deployed in another namespace. Uh, so great pattern there. Uh, just one other example would be that if you were to say create a configuration resource for your operator, you could add a flag to turn it off without actually disabling or scaling down the deployment that backs it. And that is a very powerful debugging thing that you could put in. Uh, you also see this with ignore annotations and that kind of thing. But creating formal APIs around that so people can depend on the version uh, so that you know, the, you always have a reliable way to turn off your operator for the years to come that it's supposed to be delivering value to you uh, is something to consider when building your own controllers. So um, great examples from the real world. And uh, ultimately, I think that when you combine the mechanisms with controllers in the Kubernetes world, uh, we can get away from this config drift problem, right, Chris? Absolutely, and you can kind of see this. I mean, if we if we really start to look at it, the new world of this is going to allow dynamic configuration to be passed directly to your operators. The control loop is going to go and uh, go and configure everything uh, for you. And so this world of a, a server that's out of sync is just not going to happen. So realistically, if we look at Carol's example again, she's going to deploy. It's going to active, actively reconcile and eventually get to their correct state. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you so much for coming to our talk. Uh, I'm Chris Hyde. I'm Lee.
And uh, please get in touch with us or uh, if we've got time, we're open for questions. Thank you. Anybody has any questions? We're here to help out. Uh, I see one question in there. Uh, we'll make sure and get our slides posted to sketch so that you can actually download these. Thanks for pointing that out. Cool. Well, we don't have any further questions in. Uh, I just want to shout out uh, great live tweets, uh, adding more context and a good place to discuss on Twitter from uh, Rich. And then uh, feel free to bring any more topics about just in general extending Kubernetes, uh, but we can talk about component config and that kind of thing in the Slack channel as well. Thanks, Lee, for the compliment. Uh, yeah, appreciate thanks. you tuning in. <laughs>